uh, on that note, I have received notice from the Minister of Justice that she wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make sure their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their places as well as notifying the business office or the speaker's table directly. I remind members to be concise in asking their question, and this, this is not a, an opportunity for a full debate, and long introductions will not be accepted. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I apologise to yourself and to members um, that the statement was late um, in being issued to you this morning. There was no discourtesy intended, but there was a drafting issue at our end for which I wish to apologise. Members will be aware that on the 22nd of September, the Public Prosecution Service announced that the convictions of 15 individuals for certain sexual offences prosecuted between 2009 and 2017 are to be set aside as a result of an historical legislative error which caused them to be invalid. Before I set out how this occurred, first and foremost on behalf of my department and the criminal justice system, I want to express my deep regret that this has happened and to apologise to the victims who are at the heart of all of this. Since taking up my post as Justice Minister, I have endeavoured to improve the experience of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system. This motivation is at the core of the changes I am driving in the department. I am acutely aware that because of this error, some victims are receiving news, bringing them to revisit past issues which are painful and personal. That, Mr Speaker, is a matter of profound regret. I know that they are being assisted through this difficult time by victim support and by Nexus. I am grateful to both of those organisations for working closely with the Public Prosecution Service in supporting them. The individuals whose convictions are being set aside were tried and convicted in the Magistrates' Court. However, a technical change in the law, made in error and prior to the devolution of justice, meant that a small number of sexual offences could only be prosecuted in the Higher Crown Court. The removal of certain sexual offences from a schedule to the Magistrates' Court Northern Ireland Order 1981 by the Sexual Offences Northern Ireland Order 2008 and earlier legislation in 2003 meant the Magistrates' Court lost the legal power to try those cases. Since 2009, 15 prosecutions resulting in convictions covering affected sex offences committed between 1973 and 2009 were sent to the Magistrates' Court in error. All were convicted without the necessary authority. As a result, the Public Prosecution Service will be making an application shortly to the courts to have those convictions rescinded. In effect, it will be as if the conviction never happened. There were 17 victims of these offences. 14 are victims of indecent assault on a female, contrary to Section 52 of the Offences Against the Person Act 19, 1861. One is a victim of indecent assault on a male, contrary to Section 62 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, and two are victims of the offence of unlawful carnal knowledge, contrary to Section 51 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885. Each and every one of these victims had the right to expect better from our criminal justice system. Those convicted received sentences which stretched from fines and community service orders to suspended sentences and probation orders, with one receiving a custodial sentence. I should stress at this point that there is no question of any of these cases resulting in a miscarriage of justice. Article 45 of the Magistrates Court Northern Ireland Order 1981 permits the summary trial of a small number of indictable offences with the consent of the accused. In other words, selected offences can be sent to the lower magistrates' courts, which have lesser sentencing powers and do not involve juries. The offences which can be dealt with in this way are listed in Schedule 2 to the 1981 order. Members will be aware that these issues relate to legislative changes which predate the devolution of justice matters. Consequently, it is not possible to be certain of all of the circumstances. As I understand it, in 2007, Northern Ireland Office Ministers wished to consolidate sexual offences law into one statute and align offences and penalties with England and Wales. This resulted in the Sexual Offences Northern Ireland Order 2008, which was prepared over a seven-month period between October 2007 and April 2008. <coughs>
During the preparation of the order, a number of sexual offences were replaced and consequently the pre-existing offence was repealed. One such offence was the Section 52 offence of indecent assault on a female. The repealed offences were removed from the list of offences contained in Schedule 2 of the Magistrates Courts Northern Ireland Order 1981 as a consequential amendment in the 2008 order. This meant offences committed prior to the 2nd of February 2009 could no longer be tried in the Magistrates Court. Normally draft legislation includes supplementary consequential transitional and saving provisions. All but a saving provision was included in the 2008 order. This removal of section 52 from the 1981 order without provision for summary prosecution for historical offences appears to have been an unintended drafting error. There is no recorded discussion or correspondence specifically on the subject of removal from Schedule 2 of the Magistrates Court order of these old or repealed offences. There is very limited record which indicates forewarning was given to police and the prosecution service of the policy intent to repeal all existing sexual offences apart from the trafficking offences which were to remain in the Sexual Offences Act 2003. A record exists of an inquiry made in December 2007 at the request of a legislative draftsperson, specifically asking whether either organisation perceived or identified a reason not to proceed in that way. On the limited records available, nothing was received indicating or highlighting the need for a saving provision to retain summary prosecution as an option for offending conduct covered by the repealed offences, but which occurred before the proposed order came into force. All new legislation goes through a process whereby ministers set the policy direction, policy officials draft instructions to council, which are then checked by legal advisers and legislative council then prepares the actual legislation. The legislature which scrutinised the legislation prior to becoming law was the Westminster Parliament. In this case, it is clear that the consequences of the changes made to the 1981 order were not identified by any of these people or organisations. The draft order was made in Parliament on the 9th of July 2008 <clears throat> and the relevant parts of the order were commenced on the 2nd of February 2009. After the legislation was passed, the PPS, relevant judiciary and legal representatives all proceeded in the belief that the magistrate's court option was available for suitable cases. Normally those of a less serious or grave nature and where the more limited sentencing powers of the magistrate's court were deemed appropriate. The issue was raised in 2012 when it was concluded that a saving could be implied. However, that approach was reviewed <clears throat> in 2018 and following further legal advice, it was determined that this was not the case. PPS contacted DOJ officials in early 2019 to say they had identified that there was a potential problem with the removal of Section 52. At this point, it was unclear whether there was a significant problem or not and PPS sought the advice of counsel. The focus of PPS at that time was on whether future proceedings for offences contrary to section 52 could be brought in the magistrate's court. <clears throat> Following receipt of this advice, it was concluded that the magistrate's court did not have the legal power to try historic indecent assault uh, offences committed prior to February 2009 the date of the commencement of the 2008 order, and that all future prosecutions for indecent assault could only proceed in the Crown Court. The PPS subsequently sought further advice from counsel in relation to the validity of the convictions obtained in the Magistrates Court after the Section uh, 52 had been removed from Schedule 2. It was having received and considered that subsequent advice that the PPS concluded the convictions could not stand and steps then had to be taken to set them aside. PPS also carried out an exercise to identify all of those cases where it had prosecuted Section 52 offences since 2009. An initial search of its database produced a large number of cases that were potentially affected, and these then had to be reviewed manually in order to confirm the correct position in respect of each of them. My department was informed by the PPS at the end of February 2020 that the further work done had both clarified that there was a definite problem and identified the cases affected by the removal of Section 52. They also noted the need to explore whether any of the other offences removed from the schedule had prosecutions undertaken since 2009. PPS also explained that it had instructed staff not to issue any new prosecutions summarily for the affected offence. 
Senior management in the department were alerted to the issue in early March 2020 and engaged with PPS about the steps that needed to be taken as a result. At that point, the plan was to take all necessary steps by the end of June 2020, but the lockdown for COVID-19 led to some delays. The department's legal advisers carefully considered whether any other offences were similarly affected and further offences were indeed identified. This in turn led to a further scoping exercise by the PPS to establish if summary prosecutions had occurred, and this identified one conviction under section 62 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, and two convictions under section 51 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885. The PPS also carried out an initial evidential review of the cases identified, as it was recognised that fresh prosecutions could still be brought by the Crown Court. Any fresh prosecution will be made in line with the PPS test for prosecution, which involves an assessment of the prospects of a conviction and also the public interest in bringing the offence and offender before a court. An important aspect of that will be the views of the victims themselves on what should happen next. The initial review was commenced by a senior prosecutor within PPS and will be completed when all relevant information, including the views of victims, is available. It would be inappropriate for the PPS to conclude the review of the cases without having taken the views of the victims or before the existing convictions have been set aside. In advance of contacting the victims, PPS asked for PSNI's assistance in establishing the current addresses for victims and defendants so the victims could be contacted to confirm their up-to-date details and to take their views as to how they wish to be contacted, including whether by letter, in person or email. PPS recognised the sensitivities involved in this initial contact, particularly with victims. Clearly, it is critical in a situation like this to have the full picture of all the potential difficulties. Both my department and PPS were concerned that the removal of repealed offences from Schedule 2 of the 1981 order without a saving provision may have occurred for other offences, and consequently the department commissioned a legal audit to identify other similar problems. The audit identified a further 11 offences that had been repealed and removed from the schedule, including a further two offences removed as a consequence of repeals in the 2008 order. Some offences were removed as a consequence of repeals dating back a number of years. Only one other offence was removed from the relevant schedule of magistrates' court order without policy intent, and that occurred in 2003. The list of offences identified was forwarded to PPS at the end of April 2020. In May, a search of the PPS database was conducted for prosecutions under the additional repealed offences. At the end of May, PPS informed the department that it had completed the analysis of the number of cases which had been inappropriately prosecuted in the magistrate's court and would further review the case files to confirm where action was required. Two additional Section 5.1 offences were identified and are included in the total of 15 affected cases. I was first alerted to the issue on the 16th of June. I was advised of the current position that PPS had confirmed there was a problem regarding prosecution of a number of historical cases and it was reviewing case files and considering options on the best way forward. In August, my officials met with PPS who advised that while the review of case files was still continuing, they were developing plans to inform victims. PPS indicated its intention to engage with Victim Support NI and Nexus NI to gain their advice on how best to engage with victims and to ensure that those affected could be given effective support and counselling throughout the process. Their overriding aim was to minimise any distress or re-traumatisation of the victims. PPS also indicated that it would seek the views of victims before undertaking the public interest test. No decisions on re-prosecution of the defendants would therefore be taken until some time after it had informed victims and given them time to digest what has happened. Following an update in the meeting, I spoke to the Director of Public Prosecutions on the 20th of September. Like PPS, my main priority was and is to ensure that victims should be protected. I'm very grateful to Victim Support and Nexus for supporting this work. They have been most helpful in assisting with the communications that issue to victims and stand ready to support any victims who need advice, support and counselling through these difficult times. Shortly after my conversation, PPS confirmed that its final review of cases had confirmed there were 15 cases involving 17 victims. Once confident that all relevant convictions had been identified, PPS began the process of notifying victims and defendants last week. 
senior prosecutor responsible for reviewing the cases personally telephoned the victims to advise them that the convictions of those who had committed the offences against them were no longer valid and that a letter would be delivered by courier the next day, setting out the circumstances in greater detail. Whilst he was not able to reach all of the victims to speak to each one of them, letters were delivered to 15 out of the 17 victims the next day. Efforts to contact the remaining two victims are continuing. He advised those victims he spoke to that he was happy to meet them and discuss the situation and its implications once they had time to consider the letter in detail. Some of these meetings are already arranged and it is expected that more will follow. Victims were also advised that victim support and nexus were available to help and named contacts were provided. I appreciate what a shock it must have been for the victims of these offences to receive this news and I sincerely regret that they have had to go through this process. I realise there has been some criticism of the delay in addressing the error once it had been recognised. Once the error was identified as a potentially serious problem, there were a series of steps to be gone through to assess the situation. I have already set these out in the statement. It was critical that at the point of announcement, the full extent of the problem was established and that the PPS had identified precisely which cases and which victims were affected. A premature statement could have created unnecessary concern and distress for a wider group of victims who ultimately would not have been affected. As I have said, my first concern is the victims affected by this error. I am assured that mechanisms which PPS has put in place will support them, and I have asked one of my senior officials to keep a watching brief on developments and to keep me fully informed. The Department has also instructed the Office of Legislative Counsel to prepare a clause in the forthcoming Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill to reinstate the relevant sexual offences to Schedule 2 of the 1981 order, where the offending conduct occurred before the 2nd of February 2009. This error is most unusual. I have therefore also asked one of the Department's senior lawyers to prepare an analysis of the factors which may have contributed to it and to develop a quality assurance check mechanism which can be built into our policy and bill development processes covering all future legislation. I will provide that analysis to the Justice Committee when it has been concluded. I understand that the PPS is also reviewing its practices and procedures in relation to the introduction of the 2008 order and what followed and will bring a briefing on this in due course. The cases which I have referred to today are, to the very best of our knowledge and after considerable research, all of those which are affected by the error relating to pre-2009 cases left off Schedule 2 without the saving clause. I started this statement by emphasising that my primary concern was for the well-being and protection of victims affected by this error. I trust that the efforts of the PPS and my department have made to support and assist them in these difficult circumstances have assured members that we are taking their welfare very seriously. It was right that we worked through this matter carefully to ensure that we established the full facts and the PPS was able to engage with victims when it could provide them with detailed information and answers to their concerns. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Okay, I'd like to thank the Minister and I call Paul Gibbon. Mr Speaker, my uh, concerns obviously uh, first and foremost are with the victims uh, who will undoubtedly have been re-traumatised as a result of this failure uh, that has taken place. Uh, I want to, to put on record uh, my appreciation for the Minister coming today and also acknowledge her apology. Uh, the Minister was not responsible for this error, but she is responsible for how it is addressed. Uh, and I am disappointed that the Public Prosecution Service uh, were the ones first out on this issue rather than the Minister last week, as I believe, uh, as head of the criminal justice system, uh, it should have been the case last week um, that it was the Department fronting up on this, particularly in light of the PPS's statement, uh, which indicated a failure on departmental officials as a result of uh, the failure. Uh, that, that said, this statement raises even more questions. An issue first raised in 2012, then again in 2018, this issue is raised. Then it is confirmed as a definite problem in February of 2020 this year. Senior management only told in March of this year, and the minister then told in June. I am shocked that it only got elevated to the minister's desk until June of this year, and therefore the announcement that a departmental lawyer is to carry out an analysis of the factors and to look at quality assuring this going forward, I don't believe cuts it. 
and at a minimum we need to have an independent investigation and accountability clearly uh, taking place. The Criminal Justice Inspectorate should be called in by the Minister to investigate her department on this issue because public confidence has been undermined and needs to be restored. And I would ask the Minister to reflect on that request for the CGI to be brought in. Well, Mr Speaker, there are a number of issues that we need to unpick. Um, first of all, it, as people will be well aware, it is not as simple as me taking control of these issues. The Public Prosecution Service is entirely independent of the Department of Justice. We have absolutely no locus or vares to speak on their behalf on any matter. And therefore, it was entirely appropriate that they should have been the people to raise this, because the error was a prosecutorial error and whether or not that prosecutorial error could be traced back to an omission in the legislation um, is a separate and different point. But the error in itself was about prosecutorial decisions, and the decisions that will be taken from here forward will also be decisions that will be taken by the PPS and not by my department. I would also gently remind the member that it did not just not happen on my watch, but it did not happen during devolution of policing and justice. So it is not as simple as saying that my department should have lost confidence um, from the general public. That is an unfair uh, representation of the facts. The Northern Ireland office made these changes to the law. They would have, like any other order in council, be scrutinised in Westminster. And many other parties in this chamber will have had MPs at that time who would have an opportunity to take part in that scrutinising process. Indeed, this legislation would have been formulated at Privy Council. And some parties may well have had members of Privy Council at that time who failed to pick up on this process. So I think it is a bit much to say that confidence will be lost in the department. We take this entirely seriously and appropriately, and we have handled it in the proper way. However, for us to speak before we knew all of the facts, we'd have placed more victims in danger of being distressed than was absolutely necessary. And that, for me, had to be the primary concern in all of this. Again, I call Linda Dillon. can Corlea, can I just... Um, like the members before me, first of all, thank the Minister for coming to the House with this. I had an urgent oral in, but I'm grateful that the statement was made. Obviously, it, we did get it a bit late, which made it difficult for us, I suppose, in terms of, of asking questions. But I also want to place on record the fact that our deepest thoughts today are with the victims. And this will no doubt have been a, had a devastating impact, not only on them, but on their families. Because when something like this happens, it doesn't just impact one person, it impacts everyone, everyone around them. So our thoughts are with them, and, I, and I'm glad that they are getting support. And I hope that that support will continue and that they will get all and any support that they need during this process. Can the Minister just outline for us how she will ensure that <coughs> excuse me, justice is upheld in those cases where it is decided not to pursue fresh, fresh prosecutions, and how... Um, we can lessen the impact or minimise the impact on the victims of those cases where there are new press prosecutions. Thank you. Well, as I made clear in the statement, um, it is unfortunate um, that the convictions in question are to be set aside. However, those convictions themselves are not in question in terms of their veracity, which obviously creates a significant issue for the victims um, of those crimes. We are currently trying to support victims in terms of the work that we are doing to support them with the trauma of this decision, but their views will be taken into account by PPS when it comes to the point of deciding whether or not these offences should be re-prosecuted. Many of the offences people will have served, if you like, their complete sentence for those offences already. That will also have to be taken into consideration when a decision is made whether to re-prosecute or not. So there are a number of complex decisions that need to be taken. But those decisions will be decisions solely for the Public Prosecution Service, and they are not decisions that I can be involved in because that would bring a political element to the prosecution, which would be entirely unacceptable. We have discussed with the Public Prosecution Service 
some of the issues, if you like, that flow on from this with respect to other elements of public protection. Um, and we have worked through those as well so that we can provide reassurance um, that public protection is not being compromised in these cases. But nevertheless, it is correct to say that if victims decide that they wish to go forward um, in terms of re-prosecution, and if that is the final decision of the PPS, they will need all of the support of victim support and the other agencies in order to support them through that period. Bradley. Uh, thank the Minister for coming here today making the statement and I would also like to go on record to thank Victim Support and Nexus who, who are stepping up in this regard. Um, I do note the timeline and I notice that the change happened in 2009. The issue was raised first in 2012. It, was, uh, it isn't clear who or how the issue, the issue was raised in 2012. Was that at departmental level at that stage? It was further raised in 2018, and alarmingly, it took until 2020 before it arrived at the Minister's desk. If the Minister does not intend to um, include CGI in an investigation, can she tell me what level of investigation she does intend to seek at this time? I think that there are a number of issues that we, we need to address. First and foremost, um, an error was found in 2018 when a court official undertaking routine work with ICOS, the court record system, came across an anomaly. So that's when it was established in, in 2018. A record was labelled as hybrid, that it could be tried either summarily or an indictment, where it should only have been triable on indictment according to the ICOS schedule. Court service raised this with PPS and the error was then identified, albeit that it was not immediately clear whether or not this was a significant issue. With respect to how it was found in 2012, I don't know, is the, is the honest answer. We don't know. But we do know that PPS at that time were advised that this was not a significant issue that would cause any concern, which is why it was then in abeyance until it was rediscovered in 2018. In terms of the length of time that it came to take to me, I've set out in detail um, the amount of work that had to be undertaken and also the responsibilities for that work. Um, because the issue here is that it wasn't brought to my attention until the, the, if you like, the views of the department were integral to being able to move this forward. We then worked quickly in terms of actually identifying if there were any other potential issues around that particular section and indeed other parts of that act to ensure that we weren't going to go public with something which would then have a drip, drip, drip effect with more cases coming forward over a period of time. I understand that it is very difficult um, and I'm giving as full and frank an account as I can. You've asked in terms of inquiry into the issue um, and how that will be handled. We have conducted a full inquiry into this. My focus is now on ensuring that we will be able to prevent that reoccurring again. The problem is, of course, that I'm giving as full of frank, uh, and frank uh, an account as I can of what, ha what happened um, in 2007, 2008, 2009. Many of the individuals who were involved in these original decisions um, are, no longer with, are no longer available. The Northern Ireland Office no longer has responsibility for justice. We now have a new department. Um, and many of the individuals who would have been there originally during the scrutiny are no longer in politics. So it is actually quite difficult to establish um, and with any more certainty than we already have. And I don't believe um, that further inquiry into the matter would necessarily yield um, additional information. I'm very clear, and we're very clear why what happened. We're not clear why, but we are clear what happened, and we are also now acting to ensure that that cannot happen again, and that we minimise the risk of any repetition. So I think that those are the two most important things we can do at this state of remove from the original events. I call Doug Beattie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for coming and giving us um, uh, this, this statement. Um, this is as bad as it gets. Um, uh, without a doubt, our thoughts have to be uh, with the victims who will have been re-traumatised again by this serious uh, error. And the statement is littered uh, with victims being uh, first. But the reality is, the PPS knew about this in early 2019. Your department knew in February 2020. You were told in June 2020. And yet victims were not told until September, and only days before the media were told we're not even giving them the opportunity to be able to come to terms with what had happened. 
These delays are due to a slow labouring justice system which is not fit for purpose. So can I ask the Minister, is the reality not that the PPS and the DOJ ensured that they had minimised reputational damage before releasing it and putting victims first? Mr Speaker, I really fail to understand the tone of the question that has just been put. I have explained in detail why this took so long to reach the public domain. It was clear once we spoke to some victims that there would be a risk of it going straight to the press and therefore it was important that we spoke to all victims simultaneously so that no victim would find out via the press what they should be told individually and privately and have time to digest. So the reason that it was not spoken of publicly had nothing to do with reputational damage to my department. Let's be clear, my department was not involved in this incident. And the suggestion that we would put reputational damage to the department ahead of the victims, I think, is a scurrilous thing to say um, in terms of my approach to this. It took time because this was a novel error. It was not clear whether that error would actually affect the virus of the magistrate's court in these cases. They had to seek senior Crown Counsel in PPS to ensure that it would. There was then a complex process required to identify those cases where um, there may be an unsafe conviction and to make sure that no other similar errors had occurred. So any suggestion that there was undue delay I think is genuinely unfair both on the PPS and I would have to say on my own officials and my department. In terms of the justice system, for any member of this assembly to stand and say that based on 17 convictions, however serious having to be set aside, that of all the thousands of convictions that the, the, the justice system is simply no, uh, no longer fit for purpose, I think is really an unhelpful um, public message to be giving. This is a very limited and a very clear error that happened. We are accountable and we are being held to account for it, and that is right. We are also informing the public of it, which I think shows that the justice system is fit for purpose, because there can be no better test of the justice system than admitting its mistakes when it gets it wrong. Again, I call John Blair. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I also take the opportunity to, to thank the Minister for, for the statement, which I think deals ably with the seriousness of these problems, but also addresses the fact that they originate for a, from a time prior to the devolution of justice. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to actions that the Department of Justice might be able to take now, what considerations are being given to whether or not offenders can seek comp compensation for being convicted in the wrong court? And if they can, would that be fair? Well, I thank the member for his question. It would be my intention were um, any of those who were convicted correctly by the magistrate's court, but in the wrong court, if they were to try to seek in any way to be compensated for loss, um, we would resist that compensation claim. We do not believe um, that this is a case that these offences were not committed or that there was a miscarriage of justice where people were found guilty who were not guilty. We simply believe that people were found guilty in the wrong court and therefore we will be resisting robustly any attempt um, by those who were, in, who were involved in this incident to seek compensation in future. I call Paul Fruit. And thoughts and prayers must go to the victims of, of these crimes today. And it's no surprise to us, any of this, us in this House, about the failures of the NIO, past and present, in that regard. But we're here about the here and now, Minister. And it's very clear from your statement that you were first alerted on this issue on the 16th of June, even though department officials knew as early as 2019, and PPS contacted DOJ officials again in March 2020. Three months later, you were informed as Minister. Now, was that because it was convenient for the Justice Minister not to know this? And if so, what does that say about transparency and accountability of this place to Northern Ireland? And then it takes the Minister, the Justice Minister, having been fully informed, a further three months to address this issue in this House. 
What does that say about her failure to provide this House with the transparency and the accountability that is so badly needed and so badly needed in reform? Second part of the question, I make no apology for not bringing this to the House before today. I respect this House, I respect its members, but my first priority was the victims. So with all due respect to the member, I believe that they had the right to know before he had the right to know, and it was on that basis that I brought the statement today. With respect to how long it took for it to be brought to my attention, remember that in 2019 it was identified that there may be an issue. And if you read the statement carefully, I was notified when there was an issue and we were clear that there was an issue. So the investigatory work was, was undertaken, but I was notified at the point where we knew that there was an actual problem. Because remember this previously, in terms of the advice that had been given was that it was not a problem. So further senior counsel um, advice was sought. When I was made aware of it, the reason that it took me to come, three months to come here was all set out in the statement. It was important that we knew exactly how many victims were affected, that we knew that we had checked for other similar errors, um, and that we were able to say with confidence um, that we were able to contact all of the victims affected. I think that that is the correct way, Mr Speaker, for us to handle these issues. The Assembly has a crucial role in terms of scrutiny and accountability. But the justice system is ultimately accountable to those who pass through the courts. It is accountable first and foremost to the victims and to the perpetrators and to ensuring that we deliver justice. Um, and that had to be the first priority. As soon as those were indicated and dealt with, then I was in a position to come to this House and to make the statement and answer questions today. To have done so preemptively would have meant victims potentially being in anguish, not knowing if their case was affected or not, or alternatively hearing in this House through broadcast media that their case had been affected. And I'm sure that the member on reflection will agree with me that would have been an absolute travesty. I call Emma Rogan. Gourmet, I'll miss, um, can call you. Um, when does the Minister intend to have discussions with victims to assess whether they want to go through the stress of fresh prosecution proceedings? Because of the nature um, of these offences, I am not aware of the victims' names, I am not aware of the victims' details, and it would not be appropriate for me to be so. The Public Prosecution Service, along with Nexus and with Victim Support, will have those discussions with individual victims about their individual cases. Public Prosecution Service will weigh the views of victims against all of the other prosecutorial tests that they need to make before they decide whether or not these prosecutions will be taken forward again. But it will be with the consent of victims that they will be discussing their views and taking and giving appropriate weight to that as they move forward. I will not, to be clear, be part of those discussions, nor would it be appropriate for me to be so. Nicole Gordon Dunn. I too thank the Minister for coming here to make this statement today. Can the Minister give us an assurance that proper processes and procedures will be put in place to stop recurrence of this critical breakdown within the legal system? A proper equality management system would have stopped this failure and reduced the risk of such a major incident. Member for his question, and I absolutely believe that it is vital that we have a system in place which checks for these things. I don't think there's a single person in this House who would um, demur from the, the truth of the fact that during periods where we have no devolution, there is less opportunity for scrutiny, there is less clause by clause consideration of bills. I mean, to put it in context, most orders in council um, in Westminster are dealt with as secondary legislation in Westminster. At most, they'll get an hour and a half on the floor of the chamber, and it will be simply yes or no to, to, the, to the order in council. It won't go through um, a committee stage. It won't go through the kind of scrutiny to which we would give um, that, that um, order. But that will become primary legislation in Northern Ireland. So there is, there is an issue, and it is one of the reasons why I am so reluctant even where it may speed things up, to ask Westminster to legislate on our behalf. Because by bringing the legislation here, by bringing it to the Assembly and through the committees, there is clause-by-clause clause consideration 
That is not to say that it is, not pos- that it is impossible that such an error could ever happen again, because of course human error can happen. But I think both the PPS in terms of the work that they are doing to review their procedures and practices and also the work that the department are doing in terms of looking particularly where we are rescinding pieces of legislation or replacing pieces of legislation, that we have a continuing clause in terms of historic offences. All of that work is being undertaken. I'm at a loss. Uh, Mr Speaker, to to recall any similar error getting through the system since the devolution of justice, but I am absolutely determined that lessons will be learned. Again, I call Gemma Dolan. And I too thank the Minister for coming here today. Um, Can I ask the Minister, is it true that one convicted sex offender has been removed from the sex offenders register as a result of this error? And if so, can you indicate what steps are being taken to mitigate any potential risk to the public as a result? In terms of risk to the public, this is clearly the first question um, that was on my mind when we had discussed about the number of victims um, and what was going to happen. And it is very important that we look at this carefully. Um, As you're aware, in terms of the um, cases in question, there remain two individuals on the sex offenders register. I think the rest, uh, to the best of my knowledge, have been removed because their time on that register Um, There was only one other person, I think, and it was their time, but I will confirm that with officials. Um, There are, I suppose, a number of safeguards, and so I want to run through those safeguards. Um, These will um, be removed from the National Police Computer Database and therefore would no longer be disclosed automatically on an Access NI check. There are two further safeguards that are available in those circumstances. Firstly, if the individual was barred from working with vulnerable groups as a result of that conviction, the bar will still stand and would be disclosed by Access NI checks. And secondly, the police intelligence database searched by Access NI would highlight information was available about these individuals. Access NI would then refer the application to the police who have the statutory authority to release information for inclusion in the certificate, even where a conviction has been set aside. The chief police officer um, and the, uh, of the police must reasonably believe that information to be relevant uh, to be included in the certificate. And so there are checks and balances in place to ensure that as a result of this, the public will be protected. The PPS has also carefully reviewed all of the cases which are historic, dating back to offences between 1973 and 2010. The question of risk is also one of the factors which PPS will have to consider when making decisions about further prosecutions. Two of the offenders are still on the sex offenders register and will go off it when the prosecutions are rescinded around a year or so before they otherwise would have done so. Can I call Alan Chambers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, certainly, I concur with the Minister's uh, remarks in her statement that our first concern is for the victims. Uh, can I ask the Minister? Have her departmental officials been able to establish an estimated cost to the public purse of potential compensation claims from offenders perhaps exploiting unlawful uh, detention claims and the cost of a package of retrials? I appreciate an an earlier answer to Mr Blair. Uh, She gave us an assurance, and I welcome it, that the Department will robustly uh, resist any such claims. But the fact is that these claims from offenders will probably end up being uh, financed and funded by the public purse. So it's, uh, uh, and it would appear on the surface that they would have uh, quite a strong case, but uh, I hope that uh, it is resisted. And also just, uh, do any of these cases uh, fall outside the statute of limitation for retrial? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, starting first with the the final question, um, it is not my understanding that that would be the case, um, but we can certainly um, confirm that in writing to the member if that would be helpful. The 17 offences which on conviction resulted in penalties ranging from a £250 fine to one custodial sentence um, will will be rescinded in due course. And as a consequence, any of the offenders could seek the return of fines or any compensation ordered to be paid to victims, and they may use the courts to seek compensation um, for their conviction. I can say, as I did um, in response to John Blair's question, my department will robustly resist any such compensation claims and will indemnify victims returning any compensation awarded. I'm conscious the error which led to these convictions being rescinded was a technical one 
and did not affect the conduct of the cases themselves. I understand that more than half of those convicted actually pleaded guilty. With the cases rescinded, the convictions will be struck down and the offence removed from the offender's criminal record. It is then a matter for the PPS, as would always be the case, to apply the prosecutorial test to determine whether there should be further prosecutions. The consideration of cost will not form part of that determination. Call Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for coming to the House. Albeit, I think it is regrettable that there was no indication on Friday that the Minister was coming to this House. Uh, in regards to this particular matter, and it may have uh, been as a result of urgent orals that have been submitted that has actually uh, meant that the Minister has come. However, could the Minister confirm if her officials or PPS officials have been in discussion with the PSNI to establish whether there are any risks for offences currently being uh, investigated or indeed being prepared for submission to the PPS? My understanding is that there are no such cases because um, the particular issue um, with these offences were around historic offences um, that predated this. And I am also intending, through the miscellaneous provisions bill, to add back in that historic, uh, that historic um, issue. So, were any historic convictions to come forward, they would now know to prosecute them in the Crown Court, um, so there wouldn't be the same issue. Call Philip McGuigan. I uh, can call you, and I, like everybody else, thank the Minister for coming before the Chamber today. And, and I note her determination uh, that lessons will be learned. I also note in her statement that she has asked a, a senior uh, lawyer within the department to prepare an anal analysis of the factors that may have contributed uh, to this uh, for future legislation. Can I just ask, are there any remaining legislative problems as a result of the changes which led to these convictions being rescinded, and how? If there are, will these problems be resolved? As part of the work that the PPS are doing um, at the moment, um, they are looking at their policy and practice around the implementation um, of this piece of legislation and also other pieces of legislation to ensure that there are no other errors that have been missed in this way. Um, because these are prosecutorial decisions, the Department would not have sight of that, um, though we would be aware where pieces of legislation have been rescinded. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I have asked someone in the Department um, to look at providing a mechanism going forward that will prevent similar changes being made without the appropriate alerts being sent to those um, who are actually responsible for the prosecutions. As of today, um, th th we are confident, as much as anyone can be, that we have identified all of the cases affected by this particular issue. Um, and obviously there will be, as I say, a review in PPS and a review in the department um, to ensure that there is no repeat. But also on the very slim chance that there may be other similar cases, we will look at that, but it would not be in relation to this particular issue. Paula Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, uh, Minister, how will the rescinding of these, rec uh, these cases affect the access and I records relating to these offenders and will possible uh, future employers be told? Um, in respect of um, access NI checks, it is um, obviously going to have an impact in the sense that the convictions will no longer be on record. However, um, as I explained, there will be the opportunity um, for the – they won't be on the National Computer uh, National uh, Police National Computer Database, um, so they won't be automatically disclosed. However, if the individual was barred from working with vulnerable groups, um, that barring will still stand. And secondly, the police intelligence database searched by Access NI would flag up if there was information about an individual in addition to a conviction um, that needed to be considered. And that would allow the chief constable in question um, to make that information available to Access NI if someone were applying um, for a job um, with those checks. So we believe that there are protections there. Obviously, we would prefer that those convictions um, did not have to be set aside. But unfortunately, in this case, we believe that they will have to be set aside, and in that case, my, um, my concern is that we don't um, have any uh, risk to public safety created as a result of that choice. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and the Justice Department seems to be problematic. Uh, they can't even deliver a written statement here on time, and we're having to disrupt. Our, so, I welcome your decision to allow more time for us to read the statement before asking questions. But this uh, debacle has resulted in 17 victims being re-traumatised. Our actions should be focused on the victims and also protecting the public. 
The Minister has indicated that she is bringing forward a new Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Can I ask the Minister, will she be bringing it forth so that it will act retrospectively and not only correct this action for uh, future cases, but can it apply retrospectively to put this right to protect re-traumatising victims, to protect the public and to avoid considerable cost to the public purse in running additional courses, or court cases once more? Well, I thank the member for his question, and I can reassure him that the Justice Department doesn't have particular problems. This problem doesn't stem back to the Department for Justice, and so um, I hope the member will be reassured by that. I can confirm my department did look into the possibility and sought legal advice um, on a retrospective fix to this particular issue. While there is a presumption against retrospective legislation, it can be achieved by deliberate legislative action through primary legislation. However, such a course would have to be assessed for its fairness and any such legislative change would not be deliverable before 2022. It would have been unconscionable to sit on the issue for a further 18 to 24 months and the PPS had a responsibility to advise defendants and victims of the situation and move quickly to resolve it. Consequently, a respective amendment would not have helped. However, it is our intention um, to reinstate these matters um, back into the system as it was never intended that these offences would not be able in future to be tried in the magistrate's court. In the interim, um, offences will be able to be still tried in the Crown Court. I call Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And may I thank the Minister, Minister for her comments so far. I was struck just to the comments she just made there about Access NI. And she said, believed, I think, they would provide a degree of protection. But there are no sort of safeguards or guarantees within this, in particular since it's out with the sort of the normal legislative process. So will the minister take full accountability and responsibility in the event that the safeguarding is not provided, despite what she believes? Well, to be clear um, to the member, we have checked, and I am I'm stating clearly there are two safeguards available. First, if the individual was barred from working with vulnerable groups as a result of their previous conviction, that bar would stand and would be disclosed um, by an Access NI check. So that is the first safeguard. Secondly, the police intelligence database searched by Access NI would highlight that information was available about these individuals. Access NI would refer the application to the police, who have the statutory authority to release information for inclusion in the certificate, even where a conviction has been set aside. The Chief Officer of Police must, be, must reasonably believe that the information is relevant and ought to be included in the certificate. So the member is asking me to take responsibility, first of all, for a decision made by a Chief Constable, over whom I have no authority on operational matters, to take, a to take responsibility for a decision taken by Access NI in terms of the screening process. So what I can say is what is the factual situation with respect to what's in place. But what I can't do is tell the Chief Constable of the day how they would proceed and whether or not they would judge those issues to be pertinent. However, I would find it hard to believe, as I'm sure would the member, that they would not find these issues pertinent in the context of someone applying for a job, particularly if that job involved access to vulnerable individuals. I call Rachel Woods. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming here today. And I would also like to express my thoughts with the victims of crimes affected by this error. And I hope the Minister agrees with me that this will come as a further blow to trust and confidence in the system on the part of victims and wider society. And we must accelerate the Gillen Review recommendations as part of this. But Minister, with regard to the safeguards in place for those who have maybe been on a register, as you discussed earlier, have victims been assured on this? And what conversations have you had with the Chief Constable on this matter? I have had no conversations with the Chief Constable on this matter because it isn't a matter um, for the Chief Constable. Um, I have had conversations with the PPS um, in order to determine that we are, that we are um, giving victims all of the information that is required. I had a lengthy conversation with him about the need to protect victims from additional um, distress and also the need um, for where it was necessary 
um, when the prosecutorial test had been undertaken um, for these decisions to be re-prosecuted where that was in the best interests of the victims. I think it is important that you recognise the limitations of the Justice Ministry. I can't direct the Public Prosecution Service. There may be those who wish I could, but I can't. Neither can I direct the Chief Constable. Again, there may be those who wish I could, but I can't. Um, so what I can do is have discussions with them and put victims at the heart of what has to be done um, in this, and that is what I've sought to do. With respect to Gillen, I absolutely concur that we need to move forward on Gillen, and that is why we have an implementation plan which has been shared by the committee, and that is why, as part of the miscellaneous provisions bill that is due to come to the committee, hopefully in the new year, we will be focusing very much on taking forward the Gillen recommendations, because I recognise that of all of the offences, sexual offences are some of the most sensitive and difficult cases that we will ever have to deal with in, in the system. They are also complex and often take a long time to resolve, and that in itself can be traumatising to victims. But when we end up in a situation like this, where people have been through this process and then find that those, those uh, convictions are overturned, that is yet another reason for people to be anxious about bringing forward um, their case. I want to reassure victims that of all of the cases that have been tried, this is a very unique and specific error. And I would ask members to caution themselves before they try to make this uh, sound as though the whole justice system is in disarray. You do victims a disservice when you go down that road. This is a very specific and narrow issue that occurred before the devolution of justice. There is no evidence that a similar issue has occurred since the devolution of justice. And I think that people need to take some degree of balance and perspective for the sake of victims, if for no one else. I call Jim Allister. Um, Minister, you say the department conducted a, has conducted a full inquiry. And in your statement, you say the issue was raised in 2012. But you've told the House you cannot tell us by whom or with whom it was raised in 2012. If you know it was raised in 2012, surely you must know who raised it and with whom and with what consequences. And secondly, is there any DNA which will have to be removed from databases as a result of this? Well, with respect to 2012, the issue was first raised within the PPS, so not with the department. So it was first raised within the PPS. I don't know who within the PPS raised it or with whom they raised it in the PPS. I suspect that at this stage, many of those individuals are no longer there. Um, but the, that, is, that is my understanding. The review that my department has undertaken is of legislation, because that is where we can undertake a review and do have the, the information available to us um, to be able to feed back into this and make sure that, for example, when the PPS were notifying victims that they had considered all the potential other offences that might have been caught up in this error. So with respect to 2012, um, I don't have that information um, in terms of who um, said what to whom at that time. Information before that period is even more scarce um, because it would be held by, I suspect, the NIO if it is even held at all. With respect to DNA on the database, that will have to be reviewed, but no DNA would be removed before decisions are taken whether or not these cases are to be re-prosecuted. And that is something that will have to be looked at in the round. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming to the House. This is a grave error. We pursue criminal justice, not least to provide closure for victims of crime, and unfortunately this has opened up a, a very sore wound for them. And I would ask the Minister to consider compensating their loss um, from the pain they have suffered now and in the future with the, the conclusion of this process. Can I um, ask the Minister to clarify the purpose of the clause in the forthcoming Justice Provisions Bill? Is she concerned that there is a vulnerability within the system and this is to protect from any future uh, grievance or mistakes? Um, well, first of all, if a victim decides that they want to pursue um, compensation as a result of this, they will, of course, um, be free to do so. And the normal processes will apply and they will have the support of victim service um, and I to be able to pursue um, that option. With respect to why we are adding it back in, Actually, the reason that we are doing it is because there are good grounds why some 
um, offences which attract lesser sentences may want to be tried in the magistrate's court because it is a quicker route to sentencing. So it isn't that we believe that we are closing down um, a potential for further error. It is simply that we believe that that particular route may be a swifter um, way to access justice for victims and therefore it was never intended that it should be removed um, from the PPS to be able to do that and it would be better if we put it back in place in terms um, of swift administration of justice. There are no other members indicating to ask questions then. I say that uh, that concludes questions on this statement. Thank you very much. Members just take a raise for a few moments, please.